Welcome to Writing the Wrong Way, where we talk about how writing works, how writers work, and why best writers risk being strange. And today I want to actually talk about a couple topics that have been on my mind. And I want to do this by way of getting in, or I want to get into this by way of answering a question uh, from Louie. Lou. So it's an old friend from high school who wrote in. Um, with a question. Uh, and his question is, to borrow from Douglas Adams, I've always loved the idea of being a writer, but the act of writing, not so much. It seems hard to get into a mind or a mindset where I can just push everything aside and actually get started. Any tips to get the ball, no pun intended, uh, or is there rolling? So uh, Lou's really got two questions here that are sort of connected. And I wanna just, or two topics. Um, so there's a question, how do you get the ball rolling? How do you really just get started, uh, becoming a writer when it's something you've been putting off? Um, which is a big question, a question I get asked a lot. A lot of people have the idea. Uh, so the, 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 but the first topic I think you need to kind of tackle before we get into the practical nuts and bolts of it. How do you kind of start becoming a writer is this question of, you know, being a writer, um, I get uh, not really asked questions about that so much, but I notice when talking to people, uh, whatever place they are in their career, but especially, you know, if people are starting out or, you know, they haven't quite started out, but they're thinking about starting out or they're toying with the idea, um, wherever you're at in your career, either you think of yourself as a writer or, uh, and often you think of yourself as not yet a writer. Uh, and even if you're writing a lot, what I've noticed uh, is that people will often have this ontological anxiety. Um, now, a simpler way of putting that is they'll be stressed out about this idea of being a writer. Um, it may be a large stress for them, it may be a small stress for them, but often they have this notion that there is a, such a thing as a writer. You, know, you, you are a writer if you are a real writer, <laughs> yeah, right? What's the difference between a real writer and me uh, is sort of the idea often. People could be doing a lot of writing. They could be doing a very little bit of writing. But whether they're willing to claim that identity um, of writer becomes a concern or a question. Uh, you know, it, I find that it takes a lot for some people to get into the idea that they are real writers, whereas other people slide into that very easily, but may not actually be doing any writing, you know? So there's sort of two things here. One, you know, this ontological question of being, what makes you a writer? What's a real writer versus a fake writer, uh, a real writer versus a hack or whatever. Um, and even just ideas, circulating in the culture about what writers are, what they do, uh, and so on and so forth. And then there's a separate kind of more practical sense of like, okay, well, how do I get myself started? Um, either because I don't know what the first steps are. I want to be a writer, but I don't know what the first steps uh, in some way. Or, you know, they maybe they're already doing writing, but they don't feel that they're writers. Nevertheless, despite the fact that they're writing, they don't feel like they're writers. Um, and they just need to kind of know how to get themselves into that spot where they feel like writers, or they, you know, kind of are writers in a more real uh, or real to them way. So there's a couple of things bound up in that question, Lou. Um, I want to though just start with the, the idea of being a writer because this is something that I was talking. I found myself in conversations about this recently in a couple of ways. So uh, my wife. Uh, uh, well, I had a couple of people talk to me about friends of theirs who, you know, they, they did some writing and they were kind of um, making a comment along. So this is a couple of different people I'm amalgamating uh, here had made comments to the effect that, you know, they were really hoping to become a full-time writer one day or become a real writer you know, they did some writing now, but they didn't think, you know, it wasn't really 
real because they, you know, wanted to kind of be full time. Their dream was to, you know, quit their job and start writing, become a writer. And anyway, so I remember my wife was talking to me about this and she's saying like, somebody had mentioned this to her and she's like, really? And that's what you want to do? Cause she's like, I live with a full-time writer and just like, it's not that glamorous. Like the way that the person was talking to them was like all these things that would happen when they became real writers. And meanwhile, she's like, I don't think any of that stuff is stuff that John does, you know? And I was saying to her, like, you know, I, I encounter that kind of thing a lot because people don't understand that what it means to be a quote unquote real writer in the sense of being full time. So one, they equate being a full time writer and being a real writer, which I don't think is a fair equation. Like how I look at it personally is very simple. Um, if you are engaged in the activity of writing, you know, if you're regularly writing things, then you are a real writer. You know, I look at it on a real nuts and bolts practical level, and I always have, you know, I was a quote unquote real writer back when I was making no money. You know, I was a real writer when, you know, I had a very good year and was started making over six figures as a writer. You know, I had, was a real writer when I was in between. I was a real writer when I was making, working at uh, Robin's Donuts and writing, you know, before and after the night shift, you know, uh, I never felt that I wasn't a real writer because uh, I was really writing. And I think that's the best way to, to look at it uh, is if you have some anxiety or you're questioning either whether you are a real writer or whether or not you have what it takes to be a real writer. Um, I think the thing to kind of keep in your head is just all you need to be worried about is really writing. If you're really writing, then you're a real writer. And if you're not really writing, even if you're making millions of dollars selling books, like even if you're an author who's making millions off your books, if you're not really writing on a week to week, you know, maybe day to day basis, I would say you're no longer really a writer. Um, and it doesn't matter what your level of success is. It, it doesn't matter if you're big or small. It's about the activity uh, of doing it. It's a, it's a sort of a job in that sense. Um, you're really writing. You're a real writer. But um, there's a kind of thing that bleeds in here where people kind of wonder, well, how much writing is really writing? How, how many hours a day? Again, there's this dream that people have of like becoming full time. What if I was a full time writer and quit my job and I made my living from writing? And they have these ideas of what that means. And what I often find is people don't understand really what it means. Uh, I was uh, in my book, The Lightning of Possible Storms, my short story book. Um, so if you were to read this book, if you're watching the video, I'm just going to hold it up for you. So this book is a book I'm very proud of. It's my short story collection, although it kind of also is an experimental novella or novel. Um, anyway, one of the stories in The Lightning of Possible Storms is called a National Bestseller. It's about a character named Jonathan Ball uh, who decides who's going to write a national bestseller. And he starts trying to like engineer uh, the formula for writing a national bestseller. And so a lot of the things I'm talking about here are kind of made fun of or thematized in that particular story. And one of the things that Jonathan Ball, the character in National Bestseller does is he buys a masterclass online course from Dan Brown. Um, and then there's a number of instances in the story where I talk about what Jonathan Ball, the character, uh, hears Dan Brown advise um, in the masterclass course. And now, I, that is actually all tr based on real reality, you know, not, I know I didn't like try to engineer a, a bestseller in this manner or anything like that, but there is a Dan Brown masterclass and I went and bought the Dan Brown masterclass and, you know, was like, okay, what does Dan Brown got to say about masterclass? This is the kind of thing that the character Jonathan Ball will do. Um, he's, he would buy this masterclass. So I'll buy the masterclass. 
you know, he would like, how, how would he react to Dan Brown? So this is sort of part of my writing process. I was trying to kind of get material for the story and I was stuck. And so I thought, well, if Jonathan Ball was stuck, the character, what would he do? Well, he would go buy Dan Brown's math class and think, oh, I'll just do what Dan Brown does. Um, and so I, in my mind, like the real Jonathan Ball here, I was thinking, well, this will be perfect because whatever Dan Brown says in the masterclass, all I got to do is come up with how Jonathan Ball, the character, would react to it. Um, and so I'm going to read you a little bit from my story, uh, National Bestseller, which is in The Lightning of Possible Storms. But I want to preface this with saying that everything I quote here that Dan Brown says, this is actually what Dan Brown says in his masterclass. Uh, so I'm just going to read an excerpt. Later on, while he was on his phone scrolling through Facebook, he spied an ad for an online course company called Masterclass. They were advertising a course by Dan Brown. It had a 30-day refund policy. He clicked through and bought it right away. The Dan Brown Masterclass consisted of 19 videos. So this is all true, by the way. He skimmed the titles and clicked on number 18, Life as a Writer. The mini description read, Dan explains the importance of persistence, shares tips on how to build a team that believes in you, and teaches you how to write a query letter that will stand out in agency slush piles. All things he figured he could learn from Dan Brown. Brown started by telling a story about sitting in a bookstore at a signing table after his first book had been published. Nobody came to his table. Finally, just as he was thinking he should pack up, Brown and the customer locked eyes. She beelined toward him. He smiled a massive smile. She asked if he could point her to the bathroom. Brown chuckled, remembering the pain. And at that moment, I felt as low as I possibly could feel as a writer. Here, I had just spent almost two years writing this book, and really nobody wanted to talk to me about it. Nobody wanted to buy it. And what I learned from that moment was that the process itself needs to be the reward. Brown went on to explain how his first three books had failed. However, retroactively, with the success of The Da Vinci Code, they became popular and now are thought of as big hits. Brown then detailed how during the five years in between his first book being published and The Da Vinci Code becoming a bestseller, he spent a massive amount of time and energy promoting his own books, managing to sell just enough copies that his publisher wanted the next book, although not enough copies to have a self-sustaining career. Brown just kept focusing on selling a little more, a little more, till finally he reached a combination of hitting a tipping point with his work and having a bit of luck with his writing. Brown then noted, as Caleb had, about how a writer needed to surround himself with other people, publishers, agents, and booksellers, who were also invested in his success. Without the slow build of the previous books, Brown would never have been in the position for a publisher to justify the kind of marketing that made a success like The Da Vinci Code possible. Jonathan, the character, looked over his notes. First, Dan Brown had to relearn that the focus should be on the writing, not on career success. All things Caleb had just told him, the things he had previously called, told Caleb, Brown was now telling him too. Second, Brown had to spend real time and money, his own time, his own money, doing everything he could try, he could to try to sell books. He bought an ad pushing himself as a talk show guest and booked himself discussing what he'd learned from researching the book, borrowed a car since his was broken, and drove to rotary clubs trying to sell books out of the trunk and so on. Third, he just kept writing books. When one failed, he wrote another, just as like Meerkat said he should, he being Jonathan. Eventually, reading the galleys of the Da Vinci Code, Brown said to himself that he had finally done it, but not necessarily in a happy way. He worried he had done his best work and it wouldn't matter. This is the novel I would want to read. Here it is. This is everything in it that I as a writer would want. If this doesn't work, then maybe I shouldn't be a writer because nobody shares my taste. Lucky for Brown, others did. Jonathan flipped through his notes, more of the same. Books don't become bestsellers by themselves. One single book won't make your career. What a load of shit. There had to be a shortcut. There had to be a way. Uh, so the... Story goes on. Jonathan Ball doesn't learn anything, you know, just kind of plows forward. Uh, something I don't quote in there, but something that Dan Brown does say, which I which I almost included, but I, I didn't include because it just didn't work for the story. But something that Dan Brown says elsewhere in the masterclass is he's talking about his daily schedule and kind of what his day looks like now that he is the successful master class author, you know. 
uh, big old superstar Dan Brown. Now that he's superstar Dan Brown, you know, millions of dollars pouring in, like what, when he opens the faucet. Uh, what does his day look like? Well, he gets up at 4.30 and goes to the office. Uh, why? Uh, because he wants to get a bunch of work in, or a bunch of writing in. Uh, he tries to finish his writing day before noon because by the time noon rolls around, if not earlier, everybody's in his face wanting things. He can't write anymore. Now, <laughs> think about this. Imagine you're so successful that you're Dan Brown. Imagine you're that successful. You've, by any metric uh, of success, become a successful writer, one of the most successful writers on the planet. And still, uh, you can't get people to leave you alone to do your writing. You can't find the time. You got to start. You got to wake up at four thirty in the morning. It's just what it's like. In fact, as you get more successful, what you learn, like when I talk to writers uh, who are just starting out, uh, they're not really writing, or they're not real writers in that sense, or they don't feel like they're real writers, even though they're doing a fair amount of writing. When, when they, when they. They often have, again, that same dream, the dream that they'll become successful enough that they can just quit their jobs and not do other things. They can just become full-time writers. Um, <laughs> but what being a full-time writer means is that you are now the full-time secretary of a successful writer yourself. Um, and it's still a struggle. In fact, it's more of a struggle. You right now, when you're unsuccessful and nobody um, you know, is clamoring for your next manuscript, right now you have the most amount of free time. Uh, right now you have the most freedom. Right now is when you have the most uh, possibility uh, to structure your day in the way that you want it to be structured. Uh, you know, And you could say, well, I've got this job, I've got that job, I've got this responsibility, I've got that responsibility. That doesn't go away. Uh, it just becomes worse in many respects. You know, when you move into the situation where you're making your 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 full time career uh, being a writer, I mean, what that means, even if you're at the level of a Dan Brown or a Stephen King, is that you spend a lot of your day looking at contracts, answering emails, doing office work. Even if you have an assistant, you know they can't sign the contract for you. They can't make the decision. Um, do you allow X? You know, I mean, you could slide into that territory, but it's dangerous. And so there's always going to be that. You know, as your career becomes bigger and bigger, and as people want to talk to you more, um, and you're being offered things um, rather than scrambling to get things. Um, as you know, opportunity is coming your way and you're getting to kind of have a bigger name, it just gets harder and harder and harder in many respects. Like, yes, there's things that get easier. Um, but the thing that doesn't get easier is having the time. Um, and the quote unquote, the idea that like there's a, there's a moment when you become a full-time writer or a real writer and it just suddenly the problems dissolve away and uh, people leave you alone because they think, oh, what you're doing is important. No, it never, it never gets to that point. I will sit here in the middle of things and people will walk up to me, literally my family will walk up to me and like ask me to do something, interrupting me in the middle of what I'm doing. And, it's, and you know what? It's not their fault. It's my fault because I'm here in the house. I don't have a door on my office, uh, which is a mistake that I made. Um, and it doesn't look like I'm doing anything. And technically speaking, I do have the flexibility that I could stop what I'm doing and come back to it. So uh, 
I'm easy to interrupt in that sense. Um, you know, it's kind of this two-edged sword. Like I have the, I'm not a super successful writer, but I have enough success in my career that, you know, this is my career. Um, and therefore, <laughs> the assumption of others is like, oh, well, he's in control of his time then. He can therefore do this thing for me. Um, and they're not wrong on a certain level, but it just doesn't get easier you know, is the point. It doesn't get easier. You have more time and you have more freedom when nobody wants anything from you. Nobody expects anything from you. You're not making money. Um, that's when you have the freedom. You know, uh, there is no future magic time when it gets easier. It always gets harder. Um, and so the idea that you would somehow put off being a writer uh, for any reason uh, if it's really something you want to do, uh, is one you just have to get over as fast as possible. There is no, it does not get easier. Um, now, the side note here is, if you don't really like the act of writing that much, you know, I question why people want to be a writer. Being a writer is not what you think it is. There is no glamour in being a writer. I always think about Neil Gaiman, who, you know, uh, is, of course, one of the massively successful writers. Neil Gaiman, years ago, um, I remember was he's with Amanda Palmer. He was. I remember my wife was looking at a gossip mag online, some gossip blog, Perez Hilton, I think it was. And it had a picture of Neil Gaiman and Amanda Palmer on a red carpet, you know, for the Grammys or something. I don't know what it was. But it's, you know, Neil Gaiman and Amanda Palmer on the red carpet, right? And it's a photo, like a like a paparazzi photo. And this is, you know, Neil Gaiman at this time was more successful than he is right now. You know, he was a superstar. He is still a superstar, but at this time he was even more of a superstar. Like he had just come off a of core line and all this, all these other hits. So anyhow, the caption of the picture was. Amanda Palmer and friend. And I remember looking at that picture and thinking to myself, well, that is pretty much summarizes the glory and the glamour of being a writer. Amanda Palmer and friend. You know? So if being a writer isn't what you think it is, you get into the question of, do you really want to be a writer? Um, I would say to really think about that idea. If you don't like the act of writing that much, um, one, I would argue it's not worth being a writer. Like, why would you want to be one? Um, it's not necessarily a good goal in that sense. But two, the paradox of it is it's very, very hard to have success if you don't actually like the process of writing. Now, I'm not saying you have to be in love with the process. Although on a level, I think maybe you do. So maybe that's poorly phrased. What I mean is, I think you do need to love the process. You do need to like the process. You do need to like really commit to the act of writing. Again, like to be a real writer, you have to really write. But um, the idea that you would always enjoy it, um, that every moment of it would be fun and magical, it, I think is ridiculous. Um, I think you need as fast as possible if you want to have any success as a writer. Get used to the idea that 97% of the time is just going to be like filing your taxes. It's just uh, something you're doing. And it's like you're sitting at a desk, you're typing on the keyboard. It's not that different from filling out a spreadsheet on a certain fundamental level. Now, it's more interesting to me and more creative and everything. I'm not suggesting that it's lackadaisical in, or and easy, or I'm not suggesting that it is um, uncreative in any may, particular way, but it doesn't fundamentally feel different from other things when you do it a lot. You know, when you do writing a lot, when you get to the point where you're writing often, 
um, you know, it just is another thing that you're doing. And it's like, it, it's, it's, it has moments where you really hit on something, right? You really have a, a flash of insight or you really have like a thing you write that you're really you're like, yeah, I got it. Or, you know, there's moments where you just have those, that joy. You shouldn't expect to have the joy all the time. You know, th those moments of joy, those flashes of greatness, um, those little, you know, pockets where you, you just feel the connection to what you're doing and you feel like love for the work. Those are what it's really about in, on a lot of levels. And those are what, um, why you keep doing it. But you don't need to feel that way all the time. You shouldn't expect to feel that way all the time. You should expect to rarely feel that way, um, which makes you know it more, all the more special. It's fine and dandy and normal if you get used to it, um, like any other thing you would hedonically adapt to. Um, for the most part, writing, if you're a real quote-unquote writer and you're really writing, for the most part, it's just like doing anything else that you would do in an office job. But you have those moments. So if those moments um, are not enough for you, uh, then I don't know kind of why you'd want to be a writer. And I would you know, really kind of question that. But if you mean you don't like the act of writing so much in the sense that you know you don't feel like that all the time, but you feel it sometimes, well, that's fine. I think that's great and normal. And that's, you know, you should, so I'm not sure from the question here, but, you know, is this, when you say you don't like the act of writing so much, do you just mean like, you know, I don't love it every second I'm doing it? Well, that's good and fine and normal. A lot of people don't think it is. But if you mean like, there's nothing you really like about it, you just like the idea of being a writer. Well, I would say the idea of being a writer you have is probably a romantic idea that, never really was true and certainly is no longer true. Um, so, uh, you know, I just kind of question whether or not you should, I guess, work to become a writer, but then just get to the practical nuts and bolts of it. Uh, how do you push everything aside and actually get started? Well, this is the key is you have to reframe your question there. That's the idea. The idea that you have to get into a mindset where you can push everything else aside and before you can get started. That's the problem. The problem is that you think you have to get into a mindset. You don't. The problem is you think you have to push everything else aside. You can never push everything else aside. Uh, all you need to just do is actually get started. All you need to worry about is just starting. So you do it like any other thing. You focus on the habit rather than um, outcomes. Uh, you create a system uh, which is going to produce the outcome, and then you just focus on working the system. So if your outcome is uh, writing, you know, produce getting a lot of writing done. So let's say my outcome uh, is, you know, uh, I want to write a novel. Well, to write a novel, I need to write words on a pieces of paper. I need to structure it. I need to write words down. You know, I need to do this. I need to do that. There's like a bunch of things you would have to do to write a novel. So you basically you figure out first, what are your outcomes? So let's, I'm just picking novel as an example to write a novel. I need to do, uh, I need to write words. I need to, uh, maybe read other novels. Um, I need to study, uh, writing itself and improve my skills as a writer. Um, and I need, so that could be, you know, taking a class, um, perhaps. And I need to do a lot of other related. There is a great uh, book by a guy named James Clear, uh, which is all about habit formation and sort of the science of, it's called, um, <laughs> no, I can't remember. It's called Atomic Habits. And it's a little bit of habit formation and about sort of some of the science and some of the sort of just logic 
of getting a habit going. Basically, you figure out the outcomes. You know, what habits do you need to have in place to be successful to get you the outcomes? It's just systems um, that you have to establish. So, you know, you need to write words. You need to probably read words. You need to do studying and become uh, better. So basically, you just sort of figure out um, how to build those habits, you know. So on a really simple level, Lou, like, uh, or for anyone listening, if this is sort of the place you're at, one, the mindset you need to get into is really just, I need to get, throw away your romantic ideas of what it means to be a writer. Think about writing as ditch digging. It's not different from digging ditches. If you want a hole in the ground to run a pipe through or whatever, you need to go out there and you need to figure out, okay, where am I going to put this hole? And then you need to go get a shovel. And then you got to be like, okay, I'll start. How do you start? Well, you start by just putting the shovel in the ground. Even if you walk away from the shovel and come back a week later, at least you got that shovel in the ground. At least you know where the ditch is going to go. And then, you know, you take one load of dirt out of the ditch, take another load uh, tomorrow. Take another, if you can get a whole wheelbarrow of dirt out, great. If you can just get one shovel full, that's great too. Uh, it's still moving you toward the ditch being dug. And writing uh, a writing project is not dissimilar. You know, you got to get those words on that page. You got to, you know, just, just get to it. Um, you need to get rid, the, the biggest work that you have to do, honestly, to get started is to throw away the idea, uh, which is hard. It's a really ingrained idea that the culture has given us and pounded into our heads. You have to take the idea that writing is special and you need to throw it in the trash. Being a writer is not a special thing. Writing is not special. You don't need to be you know, anything other than literate uh, to start writing. And you don't need to be good to start writing. You don't need to have a lot of time. You just take anything. You know, write for five minutes. Write one sentence. Is that enough? A sentence a day? Is that enough to have a career as a writer? No. But that's what you're trying to do right now. You try and just get going. Um, so just start small. You know, have a small small goal you know i really do recommend the book atomic habits um because i think that is a good uh basic um way to think about habit formation and some of the science of habit formation but uh it doesn't really have anything to do with writing um what you really more than anything need to do is establish a schedule. Like when will you write? Establish the schedule for your writing. Um, I have a long article about this. If you go to jonathanball.com slash schedule, uh, you'll see my long article about how to write a lot by writing on schedule. So that's at jonathanball.com slash schedule. Uh, I also have a free email course um, where you can kind of just go to writingtherongway.com uh, and you can just sign up and then over the course, so I think it is five days or so, I forget, uh, it'll just send you sort of a little activity to do every day. And that kind of gets you on the path to having a real writing system, a writing schedule, a writing system. Um, so I've talked about this in other places, uh, but, you know, check out writingtherongway.com, sign up for this write every week uh, email course, go to jonathanball.com slash schedule, uh, read my article, write a lot for writing on schedule. But more importantly, you know, you don't even have to do those things uh, as long as you start a schedule. <laughs> Just decide uh, in the next week, you know, or from now on, you know, or whatever it is, like when do you have 10 minutes in your day, five minutes in your day? And you're just going to write for those 10 minutes, those five minutes. If you don't know what to write, just write about what's in your refrigerator. Doesn't matter what you're doing. Just write anything. Start writing a poem, start writing a story, start writing just a sentence that you think is fun and cool. What's the most interesting way to describe the objects that are on your desk? Um, write a little sentence about your life, write anything, just get writing. Don't worry about it being good. Don't worry about it being publishable. Don't worry about whether or not you're a real writer 
you know, or whether you're ever going to become a full-time writer or if I was going to let you quit your job, you know, just, just get going with it. Uh, get in the motion of it. Um, get the activity flowing. Uh, get really writing, you know. Uh, put no pressure on yourself other than the pressure to produce a few words for the next five minutes. Um, throw them away when you're done if that's what you need to do to just take the pressure off. Uh, do anything that you need to do to just get yourself started. Um, don't make a big bombastic goal. Don't decide you're going to write a 10 book series. Don't decide you need six hours a day or you're never going to be anything. Don't decide you need to make six figures or you're never going to succeed. Forget about the idea that you need to be a genius. Forget about the idea that you need to have a good idea. Uh, none of that stuff matters. It's all just stuff that's going to get in your way. Later on, when you get into the habit, later on, when you've established the system, later on, when you're producing writing at a regular rate and you can have some predictability in your outcomes, at that point, you might want to think seriously about, okay, can I make a career out of this? You know, Am I going to pull off a larger project? Am I going to try to do something like writing a book? Am I going to try to do something like, you know, um, making a career out of this? That's all stuff to worry about at some later future point. Uh, if you can't get to the point where you have the ability to produce writing on a regular frequency, um, none of that stuff matters. It, it will never become... Um, feasible to have a writing career. Um, and that shouldn't fill you with anxiety. You shouldn't be worried about like, oh, what if I can never do this? Uh, because that's not helpful. Um, what you need to do is just, just make it real simple and easy for yourself. Just think to yourself, you know what really being a writer means? It means really writing. I'm a real writer if I'm really writing. Uh, and all that means is if I take five minutes every day or, you know, 10 minutes every second day or whatever, and I just sit down and I write something fun, enjoy myself, throw it in the trash, that's still you being real. You're just more writing than most people do. Um, it will get you a long way. It sounds like it doesn't matter, but it does get you a long way. Uh, a friend of ours a friend of the podcast, Zach, who uh, works on some projects with us. He once um, was sitting at a booth. This guy comes up to him and sees him drawing. And this guy says, oh, man, you know, I would give anything to do what you do. And, you know, and Zach is, you know, and be a, be a real artist. And Zach's, you know, trying to be helpful. So Zach goes, well, you know, just starts with just, you know, just, you know, grab a piece of paper and a pen and just start, you know, sketching for five minutes a day. And the guy's like, oh, I can never do that. And Zach and says, like, you just told me you'd give anything and now you don't want to screw around for five minutes a day. Yeah, it takes more than that. But if you can't do that, you know, then you really don't want to. It's not your dream. And that's fine. But don't let the idea that, you know, you need to pursue this dream become the reason you don't. Um, just really simplify it, break it down, get off your, you know, throw out these ideas that aren't helping you about what it means to be a real writer. And just focus on really writing. And you'll see eventually over the years go by uh, how far that can truly get you. This has been Jonathan Ball doing a solo episode. Um, so, uh, thanks for the question, Lou. Thanks for listening, everyone. Keep writing the wrong way.